All right. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your indulgence. So um, for the next half hour, my goal is to introduce you to our speakers and their work. So our four speakers are all professionals working in water resources uh, in Nebraska. They all work on different aspects of it. And they're all having, they're at different points in their careers, and they're all very far along on great impact pathways for their careers. They work in industry, they work for the state, uh, they bring Nebraskan, US, and international experience to the table, and a really wide variety of backgrounds, passions, and interests. And so our goal here is to essentially give you an opportunity to understand what's driving them, how they got the jobs that they got, and what you might do if you're interested in getting that kind of job for yourself. So I'm going to briefly introduce them. I have some guiding questions for them. But after that, I'll ask you to ask them questions. And really, the goal is to have really a very genuine, you know, straightforward, more informal interaction. I actually, I really appreciate everybody moving forward because now we can see you and it feels a lot more intimate. So thank you for that. Uh, so I'll start on the left here. Our, our first uh, visitor is Brandy Fleur. She received her BS in Geology and Biology with a minor in Mathematics. I have to read this because I can't remember this much. There's a lot of scientific disciplines that we're going to get through. Uh, she received her BS in 2005 and her MS in Geosciences in 2007, followed by a PhD in Geosciences in 2009. For her PhD, she integrated lake modeling, landscape modeling, and core records uh, looking at hydrologic variability in the Rocky Mountains. So her career has included working for the Nebraska Department of Natural Resources, as well as consulting. She's currently at the Central Platte Natural Resources District as their hydrologist. Those of you know, that know the Central Platte NRD know that it's one of the more progressive NRDs in the state, and they have a wide range of very innovative programs. So as their hydrologist, she does hydrologic analysis, surface water and groundwater modeling, water policy and water law, all to help manage water, water resources within the Central Platte region. Uh, Nathan Rossman is our next speaker. Uh, he received his PhD in hydrogeology uh, from the Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department at UNL. Uh, he has seven years of experience as a consulting hydrogeologist at HDR Inc. in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, he specializes in, in groundwater flow and contaminant transport modeling, uh, geological and hydrogeological characterization and conceptualization, groundwater replenishment, Beto zone modeling, groundwater surface water interaction, and climate change impacts to water resources. Students, I hope you're taking notes. This will be on the test at the end. <laughs> so Nathan has authored numerous conference abstracts, uh, presentations, and peer-reviewed research articles. He served a wide variety of clients around the US and internationally. And this includes state and local agencies, municipalities, utilities, nonprofit organizations, and for-profit companies. So really a very broad range of expertise. Uh, our next speaker is Naisi Dave. She's an environmental scientist and engineer at EA Engineering Science and Technology. So her regular tasks include data management, uh, preparation and uh, planning documents and project reports for a wide variety of environmental and water resources projects. She has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in environmental engineering, and more than three years of experience in water management, sustainability, and environmental impact. And then our last speaker uh, is George Budba. Uh, George is the Science and Strategy Fellow at Lycor Biosciences, uh, which is an international biotech and scientific instrumentation company. Uh, George, as an aside, is also one of our global fellows at the Dorothy Water for Food Global Institute. He received a degree in ecosystem science and geoecology at Lomonosov Moscow State University, a master's degree in micrometeorology at the University of Nebraska, and then a PhD in bioatmospheric sciences, also from UNL. He's a bioatmospheric scientist and book author. He has 12 patents in the US and internationally on successfully commercialized technology, devices, and methods. He's taught courses, seminars, and invited lectures internationally for government, multilateral, for-profit, and non-profit institutions, as well as universities. So really a huge resource in, in multiple disciplines and fields. So 
Let me start with the first question, and Brandy, I'm going to ask you first, and then we'll kind of come down the line. What do you find most rewarding about your current position? My current position right now, one of the things I really enjoy is I have a large amount of autonomy to pursue different projects that either are related to water quantity. So in the Central Platte NRD, we have over a million irrigated acres, which is, yes, an insane amount of irrigation, and that does have quite a few impacts to surface water. And so we have different programs that help us manage that. But I also get to be involved with projects that focus on water quality. Because as you can imagine, with that much irrigation and farmland, we have quite a few nitrogen and other agricultural chemical related issues. And so it gives me a large breadth of different things that we can work on and pursue. And so I get to do those different types of projects without always just having the same project day or same type of one all the time. And so that's probably what I enjoy the most at my current position versus my previous. Mason, we'll go with you next. All right, well, um, thanks for having me, you guys. Um, what I find most rewarding in my job is actually pretty simple because and the goal ultimately is, uh, as a consulting hydrogeologist, is to um, produce work for your clients. And a lot of the time you, you spend just trying to um, learn new information and, and build um, a good understanding of the sites that you're working on. And if I'm able to um, complete a big project, get a, get a good report together that I'm proud of, um, that I've worked on a long time, and the clients are, are happy with that, um, that's what I find the most rewarding. And um, for me, um, you know, if I get something out of it, it's, it's a chance to learn something new along the way, um, whether or not it's technical or if it's um, just learning something about the site and how it's behaving, I can sometimes take that information and um, apply it to the, to the next project and kind of keep the ball rolling that way. So pretty simple. Um, just one word variety. Um, in consulting, we have projects in very different areas of expertise. Um, and I'm someone who likes to experiment and learn new things. So I get to try um, a lot of different things in consulting. Any given day, I'm working on at least three different projects. And overall, they are all completely different from each other. Um, and it could range to up to 10 different projects. It could go from quality to quantity, environment, agriculture, water resources, all kinds of things. And there's just a lot to learn. You just got to be willing to learn. So, yeah. So like two different things about my work. So the first one is it's an interesting game because one big part of my work is to predict what science will need four to six years from now, because that's how long it takes to develop instruments. So you want to be like be able to give uh, scientists some kind of interesting product and they say like, whoa, we like it. Uh, but for that, you need to do a lot of like footwork. You need to go to conferences, you need to watch for trends at the conferences, trends at the funding, trends in the technology. There are sometimes people want something, but there is no technology for it. Or it will cost you a quarter million dollars, so they will have no customers. Uh, so that's one part. Basically, try to predict what's needed that's in four to six years from now. And the second part is teaching, because we do a lot of teaching, because our methods are fairly complex. So we do a lot of classes, and we do a lot of like publications and textbooks, and so on. This too. Thank you, George. So quite a variety of answers there. So George, I'm going to come right back to you, and we'll go back the other way. So next question is beyond technical expertise, what skills are valued in your work? Uh, you have to have thick skin. That's very important for <laughs> academics. That's very important for academics. Academics are vulnerable. They're like art community. I have business on the side. That's my family business, art photography and travel photography. So I communicate with a lot of artists. In many ways, academics are like artists. They all have fragile egos. Uh, and it's nice to have it. That's how you motivate yourself and how a lot of people motivate themselves. But, oh boy, in the industry, it's not going to cut it. Uh, you, you, people will object to things. So you, you have to, and sometimes what you think is a great idea is not going to happen for a variety of fair reasons. 
and you shouldn't be upset about it, just move, move on. And that's what I, I see uh, the people who come from academia to industry, that's where the, the main thing is, the, the main kind of disappointments. But if you prepare it, that's, it's no longer disappointment, it's just different, different rules of the game. Um, two things, one's time management. I think consulting industry in general is way faster than academia um, or university projects. Clients always want things done yesterday. So almost always on your toes. And then second, again, because you work for a lot of different clients, they have different kinds of expectations. Um, and you just, you have to be willing to figure things out because you cannot possibly know everything. Nobody will. So you have to be okay with just saying, all right, give me some time. I will figure this out. Two things. Nathan. Well, I'll piggyback on that because I was thinking about talking about time management in the consulting world. And um, really, I think it, it comes down to, you know, you have so many hours in a day and we have to put it, put our time down on a time card. And so you really do have to focus on time management. Um, but then again, if you are putting in 40 or 50 hours a week, you can usually get quite a bit accomplished if you sit down and, and really focus. Um, and probably, uh, I, I guess one thing I did want to say too, is that, you know, those tech skills are highly valued. So I don't, I don't want to detract from that either. Um, but the softer skills is going to be your communication skills, um, your willingness to just kind of pick up the phone and call colleagues or um, talk to your clients or, uh, you know, depending on how you communicate. Like nowadays we get so much communication done through like instant messaging and email. So, um, but, but just not being shy and being able to reach out um, and, and probably um, kind, of, kind of going forward with that is just, all the skills you guys are learning in terms of writing and presentation skills, um, those are going to be incredibly useful, um, whether it's from writing a report and then moving forward into, um, you know, pretty much every time you, you do a report for a client, you have to spend some time trying to digest it or distill it. And you, you, a lot of the times you end up making a PowerPoint presentation anyway. So you get, you get good at both as, as time progresses. Um, and then and one other thing I wanted to say about this is um, you really kind of have to take responsibility. Um, sometimes you'll be asked to do things outside of your role and um, to be a good team member and to, to move the ball forward and complete projects. You might be asked to do stuff outside your comfort zone and then you gotta have thick skin as George was saying. And so, yeah, and, and my boss, he, he says one thing that's, um, that I always find funny where he, he says, you know, someone tells me, oh, I can't do that. That's not my job. He always picks on those people and says, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I'll, I'll go with the thick skin again. If you're someone that is really on the ground doing work with water quality, quantity, and the other natural resources, you're going to get yelled at. You're going to get called names because people are going to see some of the things you're doing is potentially, you know, having huge impacts to their lives, their business. That's you know, it's not just money, that's how they provide for their families. And so you, you do, you just have to get used to that and accept it and still learn to work with those people. Because sometimes you realize if you just keep your cool and you really listen to what they're saying and don't just say, okay, you know, these people don't know what they're talking about. They're not gonna use scientific words that you use. They're not gonna speak the same language. So you really do have to listen and say, okay, what is it they're trying to convey? And then from there, you can sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes start to go from there and start to actually get into what I'd call the really dirty work, the hard work, the stuff that no one really wants to do. Because if you're someone that really wants to start making some of these changes, it's just going to be a lot of heavy lifting at some points in time. And so being able to really, really listen is a good skill to have. The other thing I would say is learn the legal context of whatever industry or whatever you're doing is within. Because while the science is a good driver, it doesn't work in a vacuum. You, you need to know your sideboards. You need to know what can and can't be legally done. So that way you don't spend a lot of time and resources chasing things that ultimately are just 
going to be complete legal dead ends for you. So it doesn't mean that you need to become an expert in law by any means, but have a good feel for your state or your national guidelines that you might have under what you're working with. And sometimes that kind of helps you come up with some new solutions too that you wouldn't have thought of just going from a purely scientific approach. A huge amount of insight between those four answers there, thank you. So we'll ask one more question and Brandy, I'll come back to you and then we'll come out to the audience to see if any of you, anybody in the audience has questions. So the next question is, uh, what advice can you give a young person who's interested in obtaining a role like yours? It's not going to look how you think it should look. Uh, job advertisements, yeah, it's, it's going to come from surprising places. And for instance, I can give an example, another NRD I know, they were trying to hire a civil engineer, offering salaries starting out of college, $110,000 a year, couldn't get a hire. I think they just eventually dropped it and stopped looking. Yes, Ord, Nebraska is not a place that, you know, a lot of people are going to want to flock to or seek to, but that is, that was a phenomenal job opportunity, especially for a young college graduate. And if you can handle living in a rural area, you know, even if that's not going to be your lifelong career, things like that can be great starting points. And there's jobs like that in many, many states too. Um. Well, it's good. I mean, it's good to see your guys' faces, and I'm talking to people that probably already do this, but if you're connected with societies, um, if you're just generally well-connected, um, you're probably going to start hearing about those job opportunities, I mean, especially as you start asking about them more. Um, you know, I actually got my foot in the door with HDR by um, going to a Nebraska Geological Society meeting. Uh, and one of the folks there was essentially had gone there kind of scouting. Um, but he knew me because he had seen my LinkedIn profile. Um, he realized I was, I had the same advisor he did like 15 years later. Um, but that was the kind of thing that I, I got lucky with and um, found a good position. Um, so really, I'm just kind of keeping yourself out there, making sure your resume is cleaned up, making sure you're ready to interview, um, thinking about that. It's going to help you, and hopefully you'll land a job that you really like. Um, I'd say don't discount your experience right now, um, because one advice I would give is that when someone asks you, why would we want to hire you? I have this degree is not a real answer that you can give. Um, you have to back it up with examples. And that's also something I've been noticing in our panel here. When we say something, we immediately follow up with examples. Um, and that's not something I knew beforehand. I was just um, kind of using big words, um, modeling, I've done work in water resources, but you've got to say what work in water resources, what work in environment, because it's just such a huge field um, so when I say don't discount your experience right now, I would say all of these assignments and group projects and all of those are actually real examples of teamwork, um, time management, because we're probably getting those done the day before. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and even those assignments, I, I guess sometimes you get a twisted assignment, like go out and take that sample and run it in the laboratory. Um, that's actual lab experience. Um, and that's not something I was considering when I was um, doing my job searching. Um, but when I started using those examples, everything really changed um, with my interviews. Um, and immediately, even if you don't say that, they're instantly gonna ask you, all right, give me some examples. So I would say make a list of those examples. Um, and then another thing, probably when you're a student, maybe you don't exactly know um, what specific field you want to work in in the environmental agriculture industry whatever you're targeting um, and one way to do that is elimination you just if you don't know what you want you figure out what you don't want and then you're left with some options that you can keep trying now i will second your thought about if, if uh, about examples uh, for, uh, and don't forget to write it down because you wouldn't remember what what did you do two years ago 
there is so many things happening. And, but if you if you just keep track of particularly valuable things or interesting things, so you can provide to people as example of your professional or intellectual advantage, that, that would be very helpful. And the second thing is don't get discouraged by rejection. Because uh, a lot of particularly young people think if they send three resumes out, they must yield something. That's not how it works. I was extremely disappointed. For, for my master, for my PhD program, I sent out more than 300 uh, uh, letters. I think I got returned four. It was on different topic. And out of the four, two told me no, which was at least nice that they answered. And other two uh, told me soft no. So I had to go into something else. So that my original thought just didn't go. And I was extremely disappointed because I didn't realize at the time due to basically young age and not being exposed to it, the name of the game uh, there is not like one or two or three resumes. This is probability game. You have to try, 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 try. Uh, you should expect that in 90, 95%, there will be rejection, rejection, but that's normal. So you focus on the other 5%. And, and try to work with those. Thank you. All good advice. Now, uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to throw open to the audience for questions. Does anybody have questions for the panel? Go ahead. I, okay, sorry. I would say research it a little bit to figure out the, if it's consulting or the industry and get a feel for what some of the basic problems are there. So then you can talk a little bit about that because that gives some insight that you are someone that's willing to learn and you can integrate more quickly into their, their company. You can follow up on that because it's been a pretty recent experience um, trying to find a job. I, I got this job in 2020 at EA. Um, and that's something I was concerned about, you know, in consulting, so many people, same degrees, a lot more experience. How do I stand out? I think the thing is you don't really have to stand out, stand out. You, you, you just have to convince them that you're going to be a good employee who can actually get the work done. It's really not about standing out. It's about getting the work done. Um, and to do that, I realized you have to ask the right questions. So don't ask the fancy questions that you find on Google, good questions to ask. No, maybe just ask the questions that are actually going to help you do the work when you start your job. So assume that you already have the job and then ask a question like, all right, what's the project I would be starting um, if I got hired right now? What are the technical skills that would be needed if I had to start doing this project right now? You know, stuff like that. So just pretend like you already have the job and you want to get the work going. Um, and that's something that will help um, convince the managers that they're hiring the right person. They, they don't necessarily want like the perfect candidate. There's no such thing. They just want to get people who, who can do the work. Yeah, I would say a responsible and reliable person immediately attracts attention. It's like, okay, we can rely on that person. If person that needs something, we can teach that person that. Uh, but also homework, uh, like if, if you apply somewhere, uh, you, you're going to have to apply through human resources in an official way. But if you can make contacts with these people and email the, the group you want to work in and so on, at some point they will see that resume. Uh, well, well, first, don't forget that you need now to, because resumes are now checked a lot by uh, robots. Uh, you need to put keywords in them. So like you can use uh, white font if you want. Um, so after you go through the robot filter, a person will read it. Uh, and at, at some point, it's very important that they know that you actually have enough insight to have contacted them. 
and explain them what you would like to do, that you're going to apply and so on. They might not even answer, or they might say like, yes, go through human resources, but they will remember, okay, so this reliable and responsible person did their homework, and this one is maybe fishing. So th that could give you advantage right away. Thank you. I think there was a question at the back there, and then we'll come to the front. Yes, go ahead. It's changed considerably. So part of what I do does have a lot of public, in fact, public meetings, things for endangered species compliance, water management compliance, and both quantity and quality. So where I'm getting at with the thick skinned is many times when those things have first come out, those first meetings were extremely contentious. I mean, I get done at midnight, almost one o'clock. I mean, it just was, they, they weren't fun, but now, you know, when I go into those same types of things about 10 years later, it's, it's like nothing. It's the same people. I mean, it's, they're, they get done very quickly. There's very little contention and people can work through it. And so that's part of the, the thick skinned is if you can sometimes just get through those tougher moments. And it's not even just that. It's, you know, learning the new skill you don't know how to do or your boss isn't happy with a project you did is, just getting through that, it does get better. Yeah, kind of based upon that, um, here's an example. When you do nitrate projects, for example, you got to go out to the communities and you got to tell them there's too much nitrate in your drinking water. Um, you're going to get a wide variety of questions on that. For example, did I do something? Are you telling me I did something wrong? Someone's gonna ask me, does that mean I need to stop drinking water? If I stop drinking water, where do I get another source of water? Some of those questions you're probably not prepared for, um, which is okay. I think you just have to remember that it's, you know, if someone came and told you that you cannot drink your water, what you do. So um, that public perception, I think when I started, it was the whole water quality thing. It was, there was a lot of question marks gaps, but as more and more research comes out, more projects we do, we have solid examples to back our suggestions, our answers, and then we tell the communities, well, here's something that's happened before, and here's something you can do to um, mitigate the problem or solve the problem. Um, but it is, it's getting wider response. It's getting better response than it used to get there's a lot more turnout like you said they're they're done pretty quickly public meetings they're finally starting to understand why we are talking about these things and why they matter um so i, I think that's a huge positive I, I myself am not very public facing um but i do get into contentious areas where the results we're putting out from our groundwater models um you know could potentially show Pretty, pretty bad plumes that migrate near people's wells. And, and that's always very contentious. And so we get asked hard questions. We get asked to do a lot of model reruns and uh, make sure we're trying to you know, account as best we can um, for the uncertainties and, and test different parameters to try to um, see if the bad thing will still happen <laughs> with reasonable property values. So one way you can actually disassociate yourself and have thick skin without being like angry or anything is like this. Uh, like if, if somebody disagrees with you or if somebody has different opinion, not necessarily disagreeing with you. And you can take it personally, like most people from childhood onward. Uh, or you can look at the situation. Okay, there's like there's five people here, five people here. This person wants something else. This person is convinced on something else. This people is person is concerned with something else. If you look at it as a situation and your place in the situation, it changes things a lot. Suddenly, first, it's all about business. You're not stressed. You're not like thinking about it at night. And it helps solve a lot of the situations naturally because then you're regarding all of this like, they call it power structure, but it's like preference structures. It's like personal 
mm, I don't know how to describe it, personal fabric of the team or of your audience or somebody like this. And if you try to kind of figure out the situation rather than, oh, this is attack against me or something like this, then it really, really helps. So I think there were two, two questions at the front. Let, let's, I guess this gentleman was up first, so we'll do two questions. We'll go with quick answers, and then I know we're already running a little bit late, so Rachel's going to insist that we wrap up then. So go ahead. <laughs> It's a personality thing. Um, everybody's different. Some people like to plan. Some people like to be spontaneous. And there's a lot of things you could have done, and it could have gone multiple ways. It could have been a great thing, or it could have not worked. So I, I, I don't think there's a proper way to know. It, it always feels like I could have planned this better. Um, but what you're saying is, you know, as a first year PhD student, let's say, should you have a plan of four years later? Again, some people are gonna say yes, because that's how some people function. And some people are gonna say, well, I don't know what I want yet. Um, and like some things I said, for example, elimination rule, you, you, don't, you don't know what you want, but you try finding what you don't want. Um, so yeah, it could really go either ways, um, don't, beat yourself up for it because there is no such thing as perfect career planning process. I've planned many different things and they still didn't work. So <laughs> I would maybe just add planning as an exercise is invaluable. Take your plan worth a grain of salt. Uh, you can separate it into strategy, what you want at the end and into tactics steps. During the steps, surely you need to take opportunities, right? As long as it leads you to the to the strategic goal. Uh, uh, so if if you have long term strategic goal and you know what it is, then the tactical steps, oh, you can shuffle them around, you can change them completely, and so on. Uh, and that's how you're probably going to get to the to the right place uh, the fastest. Yeah. Let's just have one last question and then we'll wrap up. Go ahead. <laughs> just one. <laughs> you get to pick. <laughs> okay. So uh, my question is, uh, when last did you guys stop assisting yourself and you begin to all the most basic things? That's a great question. Good question. So the question is, when did you last think about quitting your job and what motivated you to stay? Did I capture that? <laughs> this is a really tough one. Because <laughs> like, are we supposed to say something or not say something? It's <laughs> a great question. Great question. I think, at least for me, um, I have those days where I speak at least 10 times a day that I want to quit this and go live somewhere in the mountains and not do any of this work. Um, but I think the motivation piece is, it's, it's actually not motivation um, that comes right after the thought of quitting. It, it, it doesn't really go from one extreme to another. It usually, you just let it ride out. Um, and it's, like I said, it's not the motivation. It's just like at the end of the day, when you finally get that project done, you realize, oh, I was just being ridiculous. I don't have to quit. <laughs> so 
the thing about quitting is there could be again there could be so many different reasons where you think about quitting and i think it's probably not just me everyone probably at some extent says this in their minds just so many times a day um but you don't actually want to quit because if you actually put yourself in that scenario well if i actually quit um i'd be unemployed do i want to quit before having another job <laughs> so you know if you actually start thinking practically about that quitting scenario you start realizing well it's it's not really the fact that i want to quit it's just that this project is too difficult right now where you know it's getting too complex right now or maybe i just need a 10 minutes break you know something like that. i'll jump in and, and just add that if if you're thinking about quitting and what comes next and it's looking for a new job well then it's do you think you can find a new job that's better should probably be the next question um and if and hopefully you do a good enough job when you're planning and, and you get your resume out enough and you get it looked at you don't you don't need to worry about that too much because currently where i think about you know if, if it crosses my mind to quit i think about you know applying and looking for new work and it's it's just not something i want to go through and i think i'm great where i'm at so <laughs> but that's probably a good motivator if you really do want to try a different company or a different you know organization or different field i mean it, you're going to have those thoughts throughout your career i think no matter what yeah so there is like quitting and quitting i mean if people don't let you do your uh, there are periods when people don't let you do your job and then you get angry of course and you say like oh, i'm done with this crap but that's not real quitting it's just i mean it's that period that then ends and everything's fine and I would say, like, quitting by itself, it's very emotional. You don't want to do that ever. You want to first, if, if you're dissatisfied, you want to find that job first. And that requires a lot of work on itself. So it's not going to be quitting. It's going to be probably a year and a half search. And that needs to be done carefully. And in my case, I've done, there was a very good job three or four years ago, I can't remember, where my brother is, near Seattle, in Bellevue, Washington. And I thought like, whoa, so if we move there, and it, it was pretty good job, then I'm next to my brother, and when parents visit, we can just all be together, and so it's kind of very nice. Uh, and then we start computing, uh, like, and the, the salary seems larger and so on, and then we start computing, okay, we have two kids, so there is kindergarten, there is school, and this and that and that, and we put it in Excel, and within 45 minutes, it was clear how bad that arrangement would be. It just disaster. It would have been a disaster for real, because because of how expensive the area is, where are the schools in relation to where you can live, and all of this. Uh, so I mean, that kind of the, the changing is needs to be done very careful. And another example I have, I have a friend who was at here at UNL, and he was pretty happy, and then job popped up in Canada in a very prestigious university. He was very excited. He was like, whoa. For three years, he was trying to get back because Montreal is so expensive. So you always want to do this, like, like, uh, yeah, don't quit. <laughs> Just plan very carefully and like make sure that you're actually changing to something better, not worse. Yeah. I'll just add is motivation is fleeting. Even in the most perfect job in the world, discipline is what gets you through. And, and that will help, like you said, is making sure then, you know, I've switched careers a couple of times. Each time, make sure it's something closer to what you want. Brandy, thank you. That's a lovely insight to end on. So with that, please uh, thank our panelists. <laughs>